Okay, and this is the next lesson in the Renaissance scheme of learning. Now, within the Renaissance, we have to look at a range of individuals who had new ideas, which were able to question the old ideas of the medieval period. Now, the two that we're going to focus on in this recording is going to look at the ideas of both Sydenham and Vesalius. And then we're going to do a separate lesson on Harvey, um, as he is one of the key individuals with a case study in the Edexcel syllabus. The timeline order, we need to look at Vesalius, then Harvey, then Sydenham. But today we're going to focus mainly on Sydenham and Vesalius and look at more importantly, how they caused changes in medical development. So you need to have an understanding of number one, what they did, and number two, what change it caused. With this part of the GCSE, it's absolutely vital that you are able to explain how that person either changed things, but also have an understanding of some of the negatives. Because even though Vesalius, Harvey and Sydenham were both positives in terms of medical development, this was a time period where people still weren't fully acceptant of wholesale changes. It was a period of Renaissance humanist thinking, but there were still traditional individuals who wanted to abide by old ideas. So, first of all, Thomas Sydenham. Now, when we look at Thomas Sydenham, he's an individual who got us thinking about the cause of disease and treatment. Now, Sydenham has come up as a stimulus point for the last two years on the GCSE, and some of the feedback that the exam board gave was that people didn't really know who he was. They could give a few facts, but they didn't know the change that Sydenham made. So, some facts. Sydenham was nicknamed the English Hippocrates. Now, if we hopefully we remember this, but Hippocrates was all about the four humours. So he's obviously quite a big deal, and he's obviously going to look at something that focuses on changes in the body. To be called the English Hippocrates is a massive compliment to the work of Thomas Sydenham. He was a well-respected doctor in the 1660s and 1670s. He was known for telling young doctors, this is important, you must go to the bedside. It is there alone you can learn about disease. So first of all, what Sydenham focused on was observing your patient noting down the symptoms of your patient, making sure you had a full history of the patient's health and symptoms so that the correct diagnosis could be placed. So one thing that needs to be understood straight away is that Sydenham had more focus on observing and writing down. There was less focus on making the assumption of your humours making you sick. So Sydenham was important in getting people to challenge the attitudes, the old attitudes of, of the cause of disease. By being at the patient's bedside and writing down the symptoms that the patient's going through, it's going to be more effective in being able to treat the patient if you know exactly what is wrong with them. Sydenham believed that disease was like plants and animals, in that they could be organised into different groups. That bit's quite important, we'll go back to. Sydenham went against the idea of the four humours, as the four humours believed that disease was personal to the patient, depending on the stars, weather and diet, and other factors. What Sydenham was saying was that certain diseases could be grouped, so there were different diseases, and that disease wasn't personal to the patient, so your disease wasn't because the stars were lining up in a particular manner, which links to you. Sydenham believed that there were certain diseases which could be grouped that were making people ill. And the way in which you found out about that was by observing the patient, looking at the different symptoms, so looking at the different things that were wrong, writing them down, and then coming to a conclusion. Sydenham caused progress in medicine by making detailed descriptions of many illnesses. Now, that's the only thing you're going to remember. This is important. By making descriptions of illnesses, it's going to help people be able to treat them as time goes on. If people can identify what is wrong with the patient, then it means that they can effectively look at ways of combating the illness. Sydenham's credited for the first ever description of scarlet fever. And this is also something else that Sydenham began to question was forms of treatment. 
He believed in allowing the body to fight the illness on its own. Now, if we think of today's society, things like the common cold, that's something that we just let pass its course. If you were in the medieval Renaissance time, if you had something wrong with you, you might look at bleeding or purging, which were very painful and potentially dangerous. Sydenham tried to encourage people to move away from these forms of treatment, which allowed people to be more effectively treated and less danger behind certain aspects. So as a revision activity, you can look at the three questions below. What changes did Sydenham make? What impact did he have on medicine? And did he begin, begin to question any old ideas? If so, which ones? It's just a little revision activity. You can pause the video and do it, or you can go back and make notes on Thomas Sydenham. But remember, you need to know the impact he had, more so on what he did. It's important to know what he did, but it's also really important to know what changes those ideas had. And the next person, Andreas Vesalius. While we're going through this information, you can have a look at this, um, this spider diagram and you can complete some of the aspects. Now remember, like I said before, it's not just about what they did. It's about what changes they brought into medicine, into medical developments. This came up in last year's GCSE and it was explained, I think it was explained why there were medical developments in the years 1500 to 1700. The where people fell down on this question was where they just described what Vesalius did. So the, the common fact that everyone remembers of Vesalius is Vesalius disproved 300 of Galen's ideas. But you don't go on and explain why that would cause change. It's important that you know the fact, but also explain in relation to the question. So ideas of Vesalius, I'm going to break this down a little bit more in a bit. This is more the, the detailed stuff and then I'm going to break it down into, into bullet points. So first of all, it needs to be understood that Vesalius was an anatomist who worked with the body. Now that's one word that people get confused by. To work with the anatomy means he looks at the body. He studied medicine in Paris in 1533. Paris was the centre of humanist ideas about medicine. So Vesalius was brought up in, a, in an area which encouraged him to think outside of previous traditional ideas. After Paris, he went to Padua, where he had a very famous, where, which had a very famous university. He became a lecturer in surgery. Vesalius had a deep interest in the human body and he was keen to share his discoveries with the rest of the world. Now, bearing in mind, we've got to understand this, is that Vesalius was at the start of the Renaissance period, around the start. When his work was published in 1537, it was met with a lot of resistance and criticism because we were only just starting up with this new concept of the church losing power. So Vesalius did fight a lot of problems in this time, but what is understood is he encouraged a lot more people to take part in the study of the anatomy. So Vesalius' first publication was in 1537, and it was a book called Six Anatomical Tables. And it showed the different parts of the human body, labelled in Greek, Hebrew, and Arabic. Three of the six drawings showed a human skeleton, which Vesalius had assembled himself. Now, how does he do this? Very simple, and it's something that I haven't actually written down here. Vesalius dissects human bodies, which gives him the idea and the understanding in the human anatomy. So once he created his first publication in 1537, he used it in his lectures. He was encouraging future students to become anatomists. Six years after Six um, Anatomical Tables, he published his more famous book, which people tend to remember more than six anatomical tables on the fabric of the human body. Now, thanks to a local judge, Vesalius was able to carry out a range of dissections on, on criminals. It was also rumoured that the Vesalius had actually, actually stole bodies from, from grave sites. But the key thing with all of these dissections and all of these publications 
is that Vesalius found that Galen had made errors on the human body. He put this down to the fact that Galen had dissected animals instead of people, but Vesalius found 300 anatomical mistakes, including the human jawbone was one part, not two. The vena cava, the main vein leading out of the heart, didn't lead to the liver. Men did not have, uh, men did not have one fewer pair of ribs than women. And the human breast breastbone was three parts, not seven. So Vesalius came up with a range of mistakes that Galen had made. Now, it wasn't just this that Vesalius did. On top of this, Vesalius encouraged other doctors to base their work on dissection rather than just reading old Galenic books. He wrote that it was vital that anatomy professors carry out dissections for themselves and claimed that it was really important if further advances were to be made. If change was going to happen, people had to start dissecting bodies. That's what Vesalius said. Now, Vesalius's books, one thing that was really impressive about his books was that they were really detailed. They had incredibly detailed drawings of the human body in various stages of dissection. So it showed you the process of a dissection if you weren't able to do it yourself. By including so many pictures, Vesalius hoped that he would present this ideal human body to the people who were looking at his books in which other dissected corpses could be compared. So basically you use Vesalius's book as like a manual of other dissections to see the similarities and differences between it. Now, if you look at the advancements that Vesalius caused, you could say, number one, he made the study of the anatomy fashionable. The anatomy became central to the study of medicine, so people knew that understanding the body meant that medicine was going to be able to develop. He did cause huge conflict with traditional physicians by challenging Galen, but as I said earlier, that's because we were in the initial stages of the Renaissance period. His work was copied heavily and turned into fugitive sheets. This is really key, this phrase here, fugitive sheets. Fugitive sheets were just basically one page overviews. They were cheaper, they were highly accessible. It meant that students could access them and do their further research. His work inspired his students, one of whom was William Harvey, who discovered the circulation of the blood. So, Vesalius was significant in the overall, I would say he's significant in developing the start of humanist thinking. He's definitely significant in criticizing Galen. And this, here's just a few things going back to this, this table here. Just going over, so this dissections carried out a large number thanks to a local judge who allowed him to use bodies and encouraged others to base their work on dissection. His publications, Fabric of the Human Body, Six Anatomical Tables, which we've mentioned, found 300 mistakes of Galen's work. He had a lot of controversy to his work. Um, people who criticized Vesalius said that the human body had changed since the time of Galen, but we were starting to move away from that, that church domination in terms of society. And then his work, it was copied heavily. Uh, other anatomists went on to correct Vesalius's mistakes. Vesalius wasn't perfect, he did have his own errors. So, um, for example, after he died, Fabricus, Fabricus discovered valves in the human veins, which he shared with his students, one of whom was Harvey. So Vesalius set the, set the foundations of these ideas. Vesalius was not perfect, but he started to get people thinking. Now, this could be a question that you practice. Um, again, it's just a revision activity, but explain why there were developments in medicine in the years 1500 to 1700. You can write a paragraph on either Sydenham or Vesalius. Um, you get the impression in previous years, the exam board or some of the textbooks say that you can write in factors. I get the understanding that if you wrote about three different individuals, then you're hitting the criteria of talking about three things. But remember, within those paragraphs, you need three lots of evidence explained, and you must explain why it caused change or development. Development means what it helped in the future. So you must be talking about that in this type of question.